You know that's going to be your new nickname, right? Chunks. Chunks, <laughs> Chunks really. Say good night, Kyra. <laughs> <laughs>
and uh, we would do uh, jobs that would become available. We were starting to introduce ourselves to the advertising community to do TV commercials, industrial films, that kind of thing. Uh, but the, the end goal was always to do a feature film. Um, so when we got started in 1961, we developed a, a, our TV production company, and it turned out to be pretty successful. A lot of our success came from the fact that we would do jobs that no one else wanted to do. So uh, our reputation kind of grew from there. And in 19, late 1966, uh, we had all of the equipment, including a 35 millimeter camera uh, that one of our commercial jobs bought for us. Wow. Uh, so late 66 going into 67, we had absolutely all of the equipment we needed and all we needed was a script. So um, John Russo and uh, George Romero started on a script. Uh, we decided that we needed to expand our base a little bit. So we hooked up with the folks at Hardman Eastman, namely Carl Hardman, Marilyn Eastman, and a fellow by the name of Chuck Craig, who played the newscaster in Night of the Living Dead. And uh, we we were off to the races. Wow. So uh, so Night was filmed on 35? Yes. Wow. I for some year for decades, I just assumed it was shot on sixteen. That's uh, that's very illuminating to me. It was uh, it was shot on thirty five, and that thirty five millimeter negative uh, now resides uh, in two thousand sixteen. Uh, we made an arrangement with the Museum of Modern Art, uh, and with the help of a couple of their friends, uh, foundations, and supporters. Uh, to make a 4K restoration of Night of the Living Dead. And now the original uh, film and sound elements reside uh, with the Museum of Modern Art uh, with a whole lot of other film history. <laughs> Indeed. As well as the Library of Congress as well, when it was selected for preservation. I think in yeah. Uh, 2009-ish, I think, something like that. Uh, 95, oh, 95 in my mind. Okay, all right. Could be wrong. That's so. Excellent, excellent. And Judith, how did this how did your role uh, uh, emerge for you? Well, like everyone else, I had an affiliation with Hardman Eastman. Uh, that was my first job out of art school. And I was there for about a year and a half. And then that segued into a job at Latent Image. And they were casting for the film. And I guess they felt kind of sorry for me uh, because everybody, everybody I knew was in the film in some way, some fashion or involved in some way. And so I, I believe this part of Judy was written for me at that point. And it was really about all that I could, I could manage. I had no acting experience at all, but it was uh, great fun. And uh, I, I didn't realize that I was part of history at that time. Yeah, I was well, what, 21. You know, I was much more interested in what I was going to do that weekend, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Still, the fact that they wrote a character for you, I, I think that's... I think that's I, how it went. Yeah, I think I think that's kind of delightful, though. It's, it's nice that you're, you're in yeah, you're in that family. It was just like, let's give her a character. All right. Okay. You're going to be in the movie and you're going to get blown up and you're actually going to be eaten. Yes. Well, the truth of the matter is the uh, the the character that Judy plays uh, and uh, Keith Wayne, uh, her boyfriend, uh, added a little depth and texture to the the number of characters in the house, and that's that's specifically why those parts were added. And once they were added, uh, uh, Judy uh, Ridley seemed to be. A, a perfect choice for that character. And then we were able to cast Keith Wayne as well. I agree. I agree with this too. And Kyra, bring us home. 
Okay, well, I was uh, nine years old at the time, and my mother woke me up one morning and said, honey, you're going to flip. And I said, why? And she said, you're going to be in a movie. And evidently, my dad had dropped by the, the night before and discussed this movie project. And um, they wanted to cast me as um, Karen, this, this character, who had originally been written for a boy, Timmy. Mm. And because of the great Ohio Valley boy shortage that year, I was chosen <laughs> to play Karen. So um, <laughs> no one knew about that <laughs> little known fact. But, um, so, that doesn't blip so anyway, the you know, <laughs> So there it was. I just, it just literally fell on me. And I was thrilled because I was a horror movie junkie confirmed by that point in my life. I, I lived for Chiller Theater um, which was our local horror host show with, you know, the fabulous legendary Bill Cardill. And um, mm. I remember, oh, Bill Cardill, when we were on on the set, everybody, you know, ate around the, the grills and stuff because everybody was just cooking hot dogs and hamburgers. And I, I took a, a plate, a paper plate to him and asked him for his autograph. And oh, he wow. graciously signed it. And I still have it. It's one of my prized possessions. <laughs> So, but anyway, that's I, how I, I fell into it. Oh, that's what I, I am a huge fan of the horror host concept. I think it's something that's uniquely American and mm -hmm. has kind of been lost in today. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, that everybody had their own little locals. And for me, it was Dr. Creep in, in, in Ohio. But, yeah. but uh, Oh, yeah. What? Yeah. But uh, uh, let me ask you this much, too. Uh, uh, people are already requesting to see the plate if you have it readily available. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it, was, it was very similar. I, don't worry I about don't, it. I, I, I think I. I mean, I can like find it and and put a you know picture on Facebook yeah. or something. Dabby, Dabby, <laughs> Dabby, 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 in fact, Dabby. I think it's on my Instagram actually. So it's right. there somewhere. Go dig for well, it in my Instagram. Well, we'll 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 we'll, we'll, find, we'll, we'll refer to that. Let me th throw this out. That we'll go to audience questions. Um, the most common question that I see you cop up at Q and A is always is uh, the guests are often asked, you know, did you always know it was going to be a success when you were making it? And um, I transpose that question. I like to state it like this. When did you realize that this film was starting to kind of go a little bit longer than it originally expected and was becoming this uh, sort of cult icon fandom magnet? Uh, when did you become aware of it? Well, speaking, I, go ahead, Judy. I, I moved back out to California shortly after, about a year after we had made the film. Out of sight, out of mind. Everybody else was primarily back east. So they were far more involved in what was going on with the film at that time. I was oblivious to it because, again, I was doing making my way in the Hollywood scene and live theater scene. It wasn't until I was invited to come back for the 25th anniversary, our zombie jamboree. Wow. That I, I when I got to Pittsburgh and saw the involvement of, of the fans and all the things that Carl and Marilyn, Russ, and Jack, George had pulled together, it astounded me. And I began to realize then, after 25 years, that my goodness, our little film was still around and people still cared. Very much, very, very much. From, from my perspective, uh, which was uh, because Carl Hardman and I were co-producers of the film, um, we were privy to all of the uh, uh, play dates, the, the bookends yeah. for the mm -hmm. film that were coming in. And uh, we noticed rather quickly that uh, thanks to uh, getting a good send off in Pittsburgh by uh, George and Ernie Stern from Associated Theaters, they called their exhibitor pals all over the country primarily uh, in the northeastern part of the country. And play dates uh, were rolling in like crazy. Wow. And uh, we so very soon 
uh, after a couple of quarters, realized that we got a whole bunch of play dates, but the money is not coming in with it. So mm. we uh, did have some uh, problems with the original distributor of the film. Yeah. That um, it, it is a sad part of an otherwise very good story. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's showbiz. And yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll hold on to that, fortunately. But uh, Judith, uh, when, uh, when did you sort of realize that this is becoming a thing? The very first uh, festival that I attended was in Dallas. Be before that, I had, I just, I didn't really want to put myself out there. Right. So uh, it was kind of, a, you know, it blew me away. Uh, I couldn't believe the number of people that were there and the interest that they had. And they, they, they knew the, the most, the tiniest details about the film. Uh, things that, that, you know, all the names on the tombstones and that sort of thing, which yeah. I couldn't believe. Uh, and they were genuine. They really seemed genuine yeah. and, and very anxious to talk with us. And it was, a, it was quite an overwhelming experience. I enjoyed it. Fantastic. And hey, Kyra, when did you, uh, when did you realize that, oh, that thing I made, it's still going? Uh, well, I guess the, the first time I realized um, was when a, a local promoter in, in Pittsburgh invited me to a convention and I didn't even know they existed. I had heard about Star Trek conventions at that time, but I didn't really know what that stuff was about. So um, so I went and I was like stunned that there was a fan base and people could not have been nicer. And until that point, I I'd felt a little reluctant to discuss it with people just because it, it was weird. Like people would react, um, but they would treat me differently when they would find out that I was in it. And, um, and I, you know, I didn't like that. So I didn't really talk about it too much. And then, you know, I felt I felt more comfortable with it um, when I when I met fans of the film, and then I kind of became a fan of the film myself, and and definitely a fan of the fans because they are so yeah. nice and genuine and enthusiastic that I felt like, wow, these these people are really cool. Like I don't have to feel creepy about this. So, yeah. um, so that you know, it helped me. The conventions and the fans kind of helped me own this. You know, so yeah. I'm really grateful. Right. As as we all are. And before we go over to audience questions, I, I just want to echo, I think uh, the fans are thinking of myself. Thank you all for being a part of this. Thank you all for, for your roles in this, because not only did this elevate and expand the genre of horror, it also was a tremendous step in independent filmmaking in general. And it really, it really has, it was a benchmark for so many ways to advancing uh, film as an art, as a medium, and as as a business. So really, there's a there's a there's a lot going on here in this film. This is more than just you know people walking around eating ham covered in uh, uh, chocolate sauce, as I understand it. <laughs> so very very much of that uh, component uh, is thanks to our 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 past partner George Romero. Yes, uh, George brought a whole lot to of of those kinds of unique elements to the party. Yes, absolutely. His, his influence is still missed and his body of work is, is a testament to his vision. Um, I admit I'm in the minority when I say that my favorite one of his films is, uh, is uh, well, I won't even say it out there, but, I let you. but the main thing is we're here to talk about uh, some living dead and we've got some <laughs> audience questions. So let's go ahead and roll it out. And what is our first one? This one goes with John, and he wants to know what are your favorite memories from the actual, I'll say, from the actual set of the film? Mm. Mine was when the production was over. <laughs> because <laughs> then, then, the, then the, uh, the, all the pressure uh, was gone, and all of the pressure then existed in the editing room. <laughs> <laughs> I think there. mine mine was having wanting so badly loving to be in entertainment and had had been doing it for some years the thought of being in a feature film 
was so exciting. And to have the role I had in that feature film, every time I came on set, I think some of the most fulfilling and exciting times for me were watching George set up shots, uh, learning how movies were made by watching our little Image 10 production company put together a, a feature film. I, I loved being a part of the process as well as being in it. It's great. Outstanding. Outstanding. <clears throat> Good. My favorite. One of my standout moments was uh, the night that Russ came back from the dead. Yeah. Uh, he, we were, many of us were sitting in the living room and we watched the door open and there's Russ it, it, with that tie, <laughs> that, that <laughs> signature tie. And he just, we all, everyone just kind of went, oh, because he did look very frightening. He really did. And of course we were laughing. We thought it was hilarious. And, uh, that that's a standout moment for me. That the glassy eyed revelation that he's joined <laughs> them. Yes. Mm. yes, he is indeed coming for you, Barbara. <laughs> May I say one more thing? <laughs> of course. Uh, another moment was uh, I remember uh, Dwayne Jones. He was such an elegant man, and but he was very quiet and kind of kept to himself. And I remember while he was waiting for his scenes, he would usually be on a chair, uh, a comfortable chair outside under a tree, uh, either reading his lines or re usually reading something. And he was very friendly, but he was, he, he seemed a bit shy. And I, I'll always remember that. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Kara, bring us home. Paper plate. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what can I say? <laughs> the paper uh, plate. <laughs> there you have it. John, So thank many, you. really, so many good memories. But, but yeah, that's the one that stands out for me um, because, because he was an idol of mine and I had gotten to, you know, meet and speak to and get an autograph from, from this iconic horror host. I mean, Chili Billy was, he was everything, you know? Yeah. There you go. John, great question to start us off with. Thank you. And what do we have next? Here's one from Sarah who wants to know, ah, what is everyone's favorite horror movie if you have one? So many. Ooh. Oh, my God. So many. Mine. But I, I, my favorite, I think, my favorite movie probably of all time is Jaws. Uh. Um. So, and after that, it's like The Crawling Eye, The Bad Seed, um, Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, um, you know, uh, I mean, I could, I could like list them forever, but yeah, that's, for that's sure a, Jaws is my favorite. That's a very strong list you just rattled off. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. So, oh, uh, Day, what do you got? I think one of my old time favorites was Vincent Price, or is Vincent Price in the House of Wax. That came out, I think, in about 1952, and it was in 3D. I was just a, a, a kid at that time. My parents had no idea what the film was about. They took me to the theater. I was so petrified that I literally dragged them out of the theater. That oh. created years and years of <laughs> nightmares. My poor mother would have to sit in the bathroom with me and say, it's okay, <laughs> it's not real, nobody's <laughs> going to get you, kind of thing. But interestingly, it was that wonderful film and the scare I had watching it that allowed me to draw when I was doing Barbara. The, the scene when Russ comes back with that tie and that hand, I was, the fear I had watching that film just rushed right back when all those ghouls were grabbing. Yeah. It was a very influential film then and even to this day. Very much. 
that film's always amusing because there, there's some random parts where you can obviously tell they're trying to monopolize on its 3D with the guy with the ping pong paddle. And it's just like, what does this have to do with the plot? Oh, yeah, it was 3D, of course. They were trying to get it. <laughs> 3D. <laughs> uh, Russ, got a favorite horror movie? Um, I would have to say, um, frankly, Night of the Living Dead is right up there. But another one that is right up there is the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Oh, I just watched that yesterday. Yes. And yep. um, I, I think the uh, the down to earth element about both Night of the Living Dead and Invasion of the Body Snatchers, there are some very, very uh, similar societal uh, threats. Yes. And um, that that film has always gotten to me. Very much. You're in great danger. <laughs> <laughs> that ending. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Great choice, though. Great choice. And Judith, got a favorite horror movie you'd like to share? Uh, I'm I'm really not a huge horror fan, but I, I love mystery. I love suspense. Uh, I think two films that jump out at me were Psycho and oh. The Exorcist. Oh. And for, I love Jaws, too. I, you know, it's fun to scream now and then. Oh, yeah, so. absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, for my two cents, uh, the abominable Dr. Fibes, also starring uh, Vincent oh, yeah. Price. Mm. Uh, I think it works as a horror film. It works as a love film, too, oddly enough. So, <laughs> Sarah, yeah. great question. Thank you so much for that. And what do we have next? From Nathan, who wants to know, what were your initial thoughts of the film being presented in black and white rather than color? Hmm. Well, Russ, I'm sure I, there's I, a lot. Yeah. This has to come as a general spoiler alert. The truth of the matter is the decision was made for us from a budget standpoint. We simply didn't have money to shoot it in color. Yeah. Uh, as it turned out, um, that, was a, that was one of the secrets to the success of Night of the Living Dead. It would have been a different film if it had been shot in color and my guess is that somewhere along the line, that uh, Image 10, Carl Hardman, George Romero, John Russo, myself, would have made the decision to print it in black and white, even though it had been shot in color. But color was out of the question from a budgetary standpoint. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely fair. You know, I never gave it any thought. I didn't think color versus black and white because I grew up with black and white. I, it's hard for me to conceive of Casablanca being done in color. I, I think just as Russ commented, the film would have taken on a, a whole different tenor had it been in color. And I, I, I think it excels being in black and white. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, I, I, I've seen clips of it colorized and it doesn't, doesn't work. I think whatever, whatever that original form is, I think we tend to audiences, we imprint on and this, this, this is the film to us. And uh, altering it that significantly just doesn't quite work, but uh, maybe it works for others. I'm not going to do that too. So, and uh, Kyra, Judith, do you have any, any opinion on the, the uh, black and white issue? Well, I felt oh, as, I'm, you, as, I'm sorry. No, no, go, go ahead, Kyra. Okay, no, no, no. I no. Felt I'm sorry. <laughs> Judith Ridley, the floor recognizes you. <laughs> I, I feel the way Judy does. Uh, I never thought of it in color, and the the lighting was just so wonderful. All the all the the it was rich. It was very rich. Mm -hmm. All the all the, the I remember vividly the scene with Judy looking through the the music box in that was that was turning, uh, and it was it, it it took my breath away. I thought it was it was just absolutely beautiful, just mm -hmm. the way it was. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yeah, I I agree. I I can't imagine it in color. And and as you know, as Judy said, I. I grew up watching black and white too. So I know a lot of people, you know, now they don't want to watch a black and white film maybe because they didn't grow up watching black and white. But I think most of my favorite movies are, are in black and white, um, except for Jaws. 
but you know, um, I, I mean, I, I love black and white. I think there's, there's so much tonal variety that you can get that maybe is lost in, in something in color, you know, you're just sort of bombarded with color. And I, you know, I think, what would the blood have looked like? It had it been color, you know, it would have been like pink or something. It just wouldn't, I think it's always good to go with chocolate blood. Yeah. <laughs> Very one more, one more thing, Patty. Before we jump off of that black and white issue, sure. um, the original prints that were made of *Night of the Living Dead* um, that went to the theaters did not do the film justice. It it picked up that reputation of that grainy little film from Pittsburgh, uh, which it was not that grainy little film from Pittsburgh. Uh, and when that was finally revealed in uh, 2016 with the 4K restoration of Night of the Living Dead, for anybody who hasn't seen it, do yourself a favor because the richness that has been commented about in the blacks and whites and grays, um, that 4K restoration, it, it finally looked the way we had hoped it would have looked for its entire history. And let's go ahead and roll another one. And this comes from Thomas, who wants to know, how would you try to survive a zombie apocalypse? <laughs> Jesus. I think uh, I would I would, wear, I would wear a mask and get vaccinated for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Kyra <But> for the win. <laughs> I, I don't know that I would try to survive a zombie apocalypse. I might want to join them instead. I might have joined you know, up with you know, Carl Hart and gone to the basement. <laughs> yeah. You know what I think I do? Because I was young and able and athletic back then. I try to outrun the suckers. They never catch me. But you would fall again. Oh, dang, that's right. And lose your shoes, Judy. Oh, you know what? That I'm glad you brought that up because the fall was not intended. The first fall, I just whipped around that house so fast to get to the, por uh, the porch that I slipped and went right down. In fact, we had to add a fall to take off my shoe because I had originally fallen, not on purpose. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that was that was one thing that I thought, and I know George was really big on this and, and other permutations of the zombie genre, that he was all like, no, they need to walk. They need to shamble. It's it's when I, I don't dig running zombies either because it's the it's the slow dread of the inevitable that they're coming for you as opposed to a predator. It just snatches at you. But that's just my opinion. So, Patty, can we take just a moment to pay homage to for me, the number one zombie of all time, I wish he were here today, that was Bill Heinzman. He set the bar yeah. for what a ghoul slash zombie should be. God bless Bill Heinzman. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, Judith, uh, how do you think you'd survive a zombie apocalypse? <laughs> well, I didn't survive. I didn't, I was in chunks. And uh, so I guess I, you know, that's going to be your new nickname, right? Ch Chunks. <laughs> Chunks really. Hmm. What a great kind of take. Love the chunk. <laughs> Say goodnight, uh, Kyra. <laughs> uh, Thomas, fine question. Let's move on. <laughs> Uh, what do we have next? Here's one from Dylan, who wants to know, what was your first thought when you first read uh, the whatever draft you got of Night of the Living Dead? I never got a draft. I don't <laughs> think I ever had a script. Really? I'd come on set, and if I did have, George had some dialogue for me, I, I think I'd pick up a few pages, uh, were given to me, I'd learn the dialogue, but... I honestly don't believe I ever got to read a full script. That's why the ending was such a wonderful surprise. I found out initially that Barbara was going to be the, the sole survivor. 
And then at the very end, George totally changed his mind. And God bless him for that, because it, the ending was spectacular. Now, if Barbara had survived, would she have suffered the same fate at the end, you think? If she had survived the apocalypse, would she just have been shot? No, I think that what George wanted to do, Patty, was the final shot was a close-up of Barbara with a tear okay. just coming down. And right. then okay. cut. All right, good. I, I, that, yeah, I can see that. So, oh, very nice. Russ, since you were there at the uh, the early stages, um, yeah, but it's at, uh, at what there, point did you look at a, there, a draft there or was an outline? A, there was a draft uh, of a complete script, um, but it chunks of it were um, uh, improvisational, if you will. Not completely improvisational, but occasionally a line would be improvised. That was especially true of George Cassana, the sheriff. Um, he made up some of his lines, whatever popped into his head at the time. <laughs> and and the, uh, the professional sounding newscast that uh, Chuck Craig did, Chuck was a radio uh, reporter and announcer, and he, he wrote uh, most of his own uh, monologue about the news. Mm -hmm. uh, a sentence might be adjusted here or there, but basically yeah. uh, those were the thoughts uh, that came out of uh, Chuck Craig's professional delivery. <clears throat> uh, so there was a script, but... It was it was slightly modified throughout the production. Fair and yeah, I was about to say when you he did that he did those news announcements so well that I'm glad you sort of confirmed that he actually had a background in that. Yeah, because it was sort of too. And of course, you know, yeah, they're dead. They're all messed up. I mean that. <laughs> that's and one of, of, that's one of the other improv scenes. Uh, for I believe both Dwayne Jones and myself came when we were describing to each other what happened uh, to bring us to where we were. George said, I want you to say something about the candy, bring that up. He, he, he told me the overall feel he wanted to achieve and just let me at it. Sure. I can remember doing that getting so emotionally involved in it that, you know, the snot was coming and the tears were coming. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> At the very end, it was Gary Streiner, Russ's brother, who was running sound at that time. He said, oh God, I think we're gonna have to do it again because I don't think we got the sound. We were using a little Niagara, as I recall. Well. I'm so glad when he went back, double checked it, that we did do it again. But in the movie, we were able to do the original improvisational scenes that we did telling what happened to us. Great, outstanding. And Kyra, did you ever uh, actually get a script to thumb through or was it sort uh, No, of I finally saw one. I finally saw a script about 10 years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. It was a little, little late. Um, no, I never saw a script at that time. But And I, I had one, you know, one line, two words, and, and that was all. So um. There you go. And it, mm -hmm. Judith, did you see a script uh, before or after they had written the character for you? <laughs> no. Uh, I had very little dialogue. Uh, and there was a lot of, uh, you know, just where George would uh, actually talk sit on the floor cross-legged and, and talk with us uh, about our scene, especially the one where we were contemplating uh, the run to the truck. So uh, that was really the, uh, the, the main scene that we had where there was some dialogue. No, I didn't see a script. Oh, well, that's fair. I guess it was, again, and this is, this is also why the, the film sort of lingers on was uh, uh, like, I think the term guerrilla filmmaking was sort of coined uh, with Night of the Living Dead and uh, the style that you all did on this. So 
That's what it is. You know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how it was made, just what was made. And again, I think that's what, what lasts on it. So Dylan, thank you. Great question. I think we have time for one more. Let's see if we can go on a really fun one. And this is going to come from Josephine. Ah, how much fun was it being in one of the first zombie movies? It was wonderful. It was thrilling. We were young, enthusiastic, had never made a feature film before. All of us wanted to do the absolute best we could possibly do. And it, nobody was making fun of making a horror film. Everybody, at least certainly from my point of view, took everything we did as seriously as possible to make it as real, as believable as possible. It, it was just a marvelous experience all the way around. I think uh, from my perspective, the um, once you get past the admittedly hokey premise of recently dead people coming back to life, we never did explain how that phenomenon happened. Uh, you know, it was theorized that it was a, a blow up uh, of a Venus space probe and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. uh, which is still the way news is covered today, by the way. Until, <laughs> until certain facts can be verified, um, it, it's, there is some speculation. Responsible news organizations will say um, this is opinion and conjecture and, until they start to get a body of evidence as to what really happened. Um, so I think for recently dead people to come back to life, a uh, hokey premise, but beyond that, as Judith said, we, we handled it as seriously as we could, and uh, it worked out pretty well because Night of the Living Dead certainly does have, after 53 years of uh, being in the uh, public observation, is pretty evergreen. Uh, there are there are parts of Night of the Living Dead that are still completely relevant today. Very much. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very much so. Everyone took it very seriously. Uh, they, the crew, and I mean every one of them, they put their life on hold. And whenever they were at the farmhouse, they slept in sleeping bags, many of them, in the living room, on the floor. Uh, this was not a lavish set, uh, you know, the, the accommodations for, for everyone. It was, if you could possibly make it home to sleep, that was ideal, which, you know, I think my parents found me asleep on the glider on the front porch one morning because uh, I got that far and then I was sound, I just collapsed on the glider, um, you know, it was, it was something, it was really a labor of love. It truly was. It had to be because it was, it was, it was difficult to, to do some of these things. Yes. I was part, proud to be part of it. Excellent. Kara, bring us home. <laughs> okay. Well, the, uh, the, the question was how much fun was it? It was, it was so much fun. For me, I mean, because I didn't have the responsibilities that everybody else did because I was a nine-year-old kid. And so for me, it was just, I, I was gleeful seeing people in their makeup and standing around smoking cigarettes, which, you know, made up as zombies and, and eating hot dogs. It was funny. It was surreal. And, and I got to be a monster. So, you know, what could be better? Yeah, it was really fun. Oh, absolutely. And... Josephine, thank you so much. That was a fantastic question. Panelists, this has been an absolute delight. Any final words for our audience before we take our leave? Just thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. being here. Thank you for being fans. And we love you. That's, Just remember. You, you couldn't have said it better. Yes. The, without, without your support all these years, we wouldn't be here having as much fun as we've had today. Thank you so much. Exactly Thank true. You. We uh, we set out to make the best film that we could 
but it's the fans that have made it a classic. It's the fans have, who have kept this movie around for over 50 years now. Uh, so we thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Indeed. Yes. Thank you much. Thank you. Russ, Russ uh, we've had many requests from our audience. If you would please close <laughs> us out by saying the lines, they're coming to get you, Barbara. Well, you just took the wind out of my sails. I don't know if I can do it as well as you did. But you I did it. You are the originator, sir. I. They're coming to get you, Barbara. 